This is Ryan, the host of the Mad Data Podcast, where we talk to experts just like you that are using machine learning, AI, and of course, data to transform their business. So join us as we highlight the stories that are shaping the fields of data engineering, science, and analytics, both for today and the future. Well, hey everyone, welcome back to the Mad Data Podcast. My name is Ryan. I'm the host of the podcast. We have a very special person here today, Jessica Snyder. She's the program director of product management over at IBM. How are you doing, Jesse? I'm doing great, Ryan. Thanks for having me today. Yeah, it's been great to get to know you. Obviously, Data Man is now part of IBM, and you should be feel so special because you are our first IBM employee to be a part of this podcast. Woohoo! I love that. <laughs> I feel so honored. We had a, we had a fun time catching up at the Gartner conference uh, in Orlando. We had a really fun time there. Had a really good talks with customers about Data Fabric, and obviously today we're going to be talking about the future of Data Fabric and also data integration. But before we get going here, and you don't have to talk about how Iowa State Ohio State beat Penn State. We don't have to talk about that. Listen, it's a sore subject. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I would love to get just a little bit about yourself and you know, how you got to be a program director over at IBM. Our audience loves to hear just career paths of how people got into the space, especially data. We are a data podcast. Yeah, of course. Um, so I've been at IBM for about 10 years. I've actually spent my, my whole career here. I did two internships uh, with IBM when I was in college. Um, I went to Penn State, wearing my, my Penn State uh, sweatshirt today. And um, I have a major in computer science. So I actually started as a software developer at IBM. Um, I focused primarily on um, full stack development and then switched into front end development for a while. And then about five or six years into my career, I kind of figured I'm definitely not going to be the world's best engineer here. And uh, I you know, just kind of felt like I, I tapped out in my potential there. And I, I was really curious about how we made decisions about how we ran the business and you know what what the market opportunities were. I was really interested in how we actually build product and take it to market. Um, so I did a, a brief stint actually as a chief of staff for one of our senior execs at IBM, which was really great experience. Learned a lot of the ins and outs of how we run the business at a high level. And then when I was done with that role, it's kind of meant to be a, a kind of launch point into a, a new chapter in your career. So I was able to take a leadership position as a product manager. Um, and I, I spent about two years in product management for this portfolio, the portfolio that I now run. And then in, in January of this year, I was promoted into this position. So I run the um, data integration portfolio. Um, and I have five product managers on my team and, and they're awesome. Uh, so love this job. It's the best job I've, I've ever held. It's so fun. Every day is a little bit different, which is nice to keep things really exciting and get to work with tons of great clients and have lots of great relationships. So really, really love this role. Um, and of course, recommend product management to uh, anyone who's interested in, in getting into this side of the business. And you get to work with really cool people like me. I do. Yes. Of course, that was top of the list. I don't know. I don't know why I uh, didn't mention that one. <laughs> yeah, well, it's it is, it's it's ton of fun working with your team. Uh, I know you have an awesome team over at uh, over at the data integration uh, side of the data fabric side. Um, it's interesting you said you came from a software like engineering background, and now you're in product management. I usually don't hear that, so that's that's cool to hear coming from from that side. I used to be way back in the day. I used to be a software tester. Hey, there you go. That's a tough job. <laughs> yes, very tough. Yeah, going and telling a software engineer possibly like you that your code is wrong is probably not the best way to start a morning. Yes, there's always a natural friction there, right? <laughs> Between QA and development. Oh yeah, it's always a battle, right? It shouldn't be. We were talking about that. You know, I got to break down those silos, and even in data, this merry-go-round of uh, uh, blaming blaming others is you know a constant issue we see, obviously. But yeah. um, this kind of segues into our uh, our topic today, which is yeah. really around the future of data fabric and data integration. But what, what I want to do though is for people that um, don't maybe have an idea of what data fabric is like, give us a rundown on how we got to this idea of data fabric, because I know, I know I'm not, we're not gonna have a conversation about data fabric versus data mesh. 
But I know that's the first thing people ask about, probably. Like, what's the difference? It's like a very religious debate, right? <laughs> very religious. So, yeah, give, give, us, give us a rundown on like, how, how we get here, how we get to this concept of data fabric. It seems to be taking off, and, and obviously, um, IBM plays a major role in that. Yeah, totally. So, I think first thing to understand is data fabric is definitely a relatively new concept in the market. If you look at some of the major analyst firms, like Gartner, for example, they project that data fabric won't reach maturity for another five or 10 years. So still have a ways to go in, in the market and, and how enterprises adopt a data fabric architecture. Um, but I think that's the key word right there, architecture. Data fabric is an architecture. It's not you know product or solution that someone can sell you. Um, we can sell uh, products that help you implement a data fabric architecture. But it's really important to know that it's an architectural paradigm. And so you mentioned the, the term data mesh, and, and everyone has a little bit of their own definition, by the way, and that's okay. I think the crux of the issue is that we see a data fabric as being kind of the, the overall kind of umbrella idea on which you build different use cases. So, and we see like a data mesh as being a, a use case or an implementation of a data fabric where you're really focusing on domain specific data and you're creating data, what we call data products, which are effect effectively just, um, you know, collections of data that are specific to a particular domain. Usually we're involving someone from the line of business in creating those, and then we're creating some sort of delivery mechanism for the line of, line of business to consume that data. Um, but it's it really to us, the, the data fabric is the, the piece that everyone kind of needs help with implementation on. Um, and in terms of how we got here, you know, it, it's funny, I was uh, at a CDO roundtable a couple of months ago, and I had one of the data and analytics leaders say to me, how is this any different than some of the kind of paradigms that we've seen in the past? Um, you know, we've kind of gone through this kind of cyclical nature of uh, different different data architect architecture paradigms that are going to help solve all of our problems, right? Um, we've always had this problem with kind of proliferation of data, siloing of data. Um, so I think the, the place where data fabric really helps is we've never truly been in, in this type of situation where we have so many massively distributed um, data ecosystems. In the past, when we were talking about, you know, the world that existed when we had on-premises software that sat behind your company's firewall, it was a lot easier to control everything. Even if you had tons of different on-premises databases and various data warehouses where you were trying to wrangle data and you were trying to deliver analytical use cases to the business and operational use cases, that, you know, you still kind of had full control over the data that your enterprise was operating on. You still had full control over the governance of that data, like who had access to what. Um, you know, there weren't nearly as many cybersecurity concerns. There weren't uh, concerns around, um, you know, how you manage like this data versus uh, in a, you know, in another location potentially. And so now, what we've seen as the the market has evolved, as the industry has evolved, as as um, a lot of enterprises are starting to adopt cloud native workloads, as we're starting to shift. Our infrastructure to cloud um, to help save on cost, we're starting to see this kind of not only massive proliferation of data across different uh, data landscapes, but also but like inter enterprise fracturing, where we have, you know, especially if you look at some of the, the largest clients in the world, you might have different parts of the business uh, standardizing on different tools and standardizing even on different clouds. Like I work with lots of clients who are spread across AWS and Azure and GCP and IBM Cloud, and they have like 20 different tools for integration. <laughs> and so it's, you know, it's kind of become this big mess, right? So the idea of the data fabric and, the, and the, the premise of the data fabric is starting to look at how we can, um, you know, centralize where it makes sense or logically group where it makes sense and start to have a strategy where we're going to kind of bring those distributed data locations together, whether it's physically or logically, um, and start to be able to understand all of the data that our enterprise has access to. And then the idea eventually is to layer in things like automation intelligence. So you're eventually getting to this concept of more of like a self-service consumption model so that you're actually getting the right data into the hands of the right people at the right time. Yeah, that's a, when I was, uh, you know, obviously, 
uh, with Databand now being a part of IBM, which obviously this is not what this podcast is all about. It's really just talking about people. We'll talk about that later. But uh, one of the things that I found really cool about the fabric side was that, and I was talking to people, they would say, well, do we have to adopt the whole fabric necessarily to get the advantages of that? And the way I was communicating was like, no, like we're meeting you where you're at today and where you want to go. Like, it's not like, hey, pick up and move everything right away. It's, hey, like you just said, we're going to look to get people the right day at the right time in the right place within all of the chaos of the things you have going on today. Maybe we can standardize some things, but obviously we're not saying, hey, we're going to rip out everything and move you because I think people are tired of that. Yes. Exactly. Right. So the, the data fabric definitely has kind of key building blocks that that make it a data fabric. But the whole idea is you don't have to do a wholesale rip and replace what you have today. In fact, you know, I, I think it would be almost impossible for most most companies, even small companies to do that. Right. It, you know, we're talking about multi-year journeys, typically, when we talk about a, a data fabric implementation, especially at a larger enterprise. Um, but the whole idea is you want to start small, right? You want to pick a use case that that your, um, that would have value for your business. And you want to start kind of bringing the pieces to that particular implementation and start to look at what tools do you want to bring in that are going to enable your data fabric architecture? How do you want to set this up in a way that makes sense? And then kind of tack on pieces from there, right? But you definitely don't want to do a wholesale rip and replace. Um, definitely not not a recommendation that we would have. No, I'm with you on that. Uh, so before we get into, I know uh, I was obviously you're, you're the one of the main leaders over at the data integration side. What, we had talked about some, or we had mentioned there's some more common use cases that we see using data fabric. What, what are those? I know we're going to talk about data integration soon, but what are some of the other ones that um, you know you you work closely, you work with your colleague or peers on rather uh, within the within the fabric? So one of the most common ones we see, and this is typically where most of of our customers at IBM start when we're working with them on a data fabric implementation, is a governance and privacy implementation. It's the most common one. Um, most often, our customers recognize that. They have all this different data and it's controlled by, you know, different different tools and it's sitting in different catalogs and it's sitting in different um, data warehouses. And they want to kind of create a governance strategy that's going to work across all of their different tools and all of the different locations in, in which their data resides. So that's typically the most common where we help them figure out, okay, how how do you want to kind of um, apply different governance policies because it's important that certain things do need to be centralized. We definitely don't want to centralize everything. Um, that was the kind of mistake we had made in the past with uh, that kind of stereotypical data warehouse use case where you bring everything into a data warehouse. We kind of uh, made that a little bit worse with the rise of the data lake, where I heard someone once say, uh, you know, we turned the data lake into a data swamp. We just like threw everything into the data lake with, with no structure. Now we have a lake house, right? The lake house. Yes. The lake house is the new structure. I'm waiting for like the data roof. Like that's my thing. Like what's the data <laughs> roof that goes on top of the lake and the house and the river and all of that. I'm waiting for that. So, you know, but there there are certain things in governance that do need to be centralized, and then there, there are certain things that can certainly be decentralized. And so we help customers figure out, you know, what are what's the right approach for them? How do we want to apply the right governance policies? How do you start to bring in, like, layer in things like a, the right catalog? Um, how do you start to bring in other parts of a data fabric, like an integration tool or tool set? Um, we definitely see integration as being one of the crucial backbones of a data fabric because you're going to have a bunch of different use cases that you're eventually going to be trying to solve for or implement for. And you, you're probably going to be operating with a bunch of different data depending on the size of your enterprise um, and the industry that you're operating in. So it's really important to be able to have or be able to choose the, the integration style that makes sense for the data that you're working with and the use case that you're trying to deliver. I heard you mention styles. I want to talk about this. Like, what, First of all, like what, what are maybe some misconceptions of what data integration means and how does that back into maybe some of the styles that we've heard of? I'm sure there's tons of different new ways of doing this that, um, that uh, pop up. And I don't want to say them because I don't want to spoil it. 
but I know there's like a bunch of acronyms in my head that I want to throw out there, but I'm going to wait. Yes. So ETL is uh, definitely the, the main integration style that we still see being used today. It's it's the, I would say the, the oldest integration style. It's been around the longest. Um, we still see there's plenty of stacks from various analyst firms. But, you know, I think if I'm quoting Gartner correctly, I think like 80%, 88% of enterprises still use ETL as their main integration style today. Um, so then there's the the ELT version of that, which focuses more on ingestion. That's been, um, you know, that has cropped up more recently as a more popular integration style, uh, because uh, usually ELT also leverages uh, the concept of push down, where you can actually do the transformation logic and the compute in the, the target, typically a data warehouse or a lake house. So that helps offset costs on the integration side. Uh, especially if your your integration servers are expensive. Um, so that can help a lot of our customers kind of save on, on cost. But some of the other ones that we're seeing, replication is a really big one, right? This idea of kind of real-time synchronization of data. You'll hear the term change data capture quite a lot. Um, that falls into the replication space. Um, data virtualization is another one. Uh, data virtualization kind of started out almost as like federation and has kind of evolved into a much more advanced type of concept. This one is really great for like data science use cases. It's also really good for data quality too, um, like being able to profile in place. Um, so virtualization is becoming increasingly important in the, the kind of integration landscape. And then we have the, the newest one, I guess I shouldn't say newest one, message and event oriented integration has existed for a long time, but we're seeing this kind of kick off the, the real time integration market. And we're starting to see this kind of massive trend towards the need for real time integration solutions where we can process you know, streaming data, real time data, you know, event based or message oriented data coming from things like IoT devices, retail is really big with this one. If you think about like anything that's executing a transaction, um, anytime you're swiping a credit card, click and check out in a, you know, e-commerce website, like there's so many different use cases for uh, streaming or real time data. Um, so that's probably the, uh, the most, the newest one. But I think the thing that's important is that and, and this is one of the misconceptions that I see is that if you've been in this business for a long time, we often find a lot of customers who kind of started with ETL and then they stopped there. And now they're trying to kind of fit a square peg into a round hole by using ETL for all of their new use cases. When in reality, it's really good to actually take a look at what are you trying to solve? Like, what is the problem you're trying to solve? And then back into the integration style, as opposed to just saying, let's build ETL pipelines for everything. Yeah, that's a, that's something that, I mean, when we, when, you know, at least at DataBand, when we talk to customers, they have a mixture of a lot of this stuff. And it's traditionally ETL, but outside of ETL, the main one that they are at least experimenting with, or at least they're, they're doing right now, is the streaming and event-based stuff. Like yeah. the amount of times I've heard the word Kafka. Yes, Kafka is the major player in that space, right? But again, too, like it's, they're they're even talking about it as, it's a, a lot of times they're talking about it as they started doing it for a brand new product or a brand new area of the business versus trying to uh, uh, replace their current ETL processes. Like eventually they'll get there, uh, you would think. But they understand, just like you said, you understand like that's a big, big task to do and to reconfigure everything. Probably a lot of technical debt that you have to, re you know, there's a lot of stuff that you'd have to do to get into line. So I like what you said about just, hey, look for opportunity, new opportunities to experiment on these things uh, and not get so, you know, uh, you know, you could say blindsided or uh, tunnel vision with something you're, you're just familiar with, right? I mean, that's that's kind of uh, a, a common thing, right? Even, and that goes across all disciplines, right? It's like, you, know, you have this uh, product marketing framework you're gonna do and you've used it for the past five years, probably need to maybe test something else out, you know, for, for a new product launch, maybe, you know, same thing. <laughs> yeah, new workloads are definitely the easiest place and best place to, to try out new things, right? Because there's no technical debt that you're carrying with it. I mean, you might have uh, your own technical debt in the sense of like not having the skill on the new tool or the new technology, but 
you know, that's a point in time statement, right? Just got to sit down and, and learn a new thing and then apply that to whatever you're working on. Well, the next thing I want to talk about, which is kind of the, the last topic, but really is like the next big thing for data fabric. And um, obviously, this is a little self-serving to people listening. Uh, sorry, <laughs> but uh, we figured we, we might as well just uh, talk about and be transparent. But it really is this idea around observability and data observability. Yeah. Let us know, like, I mean, give, give us an idea around how that, how you're seeing that fit into the data integration use case as well, uh, kind of going into, you know, the future of data fabric as we know it. Yeah. So observability is definitely one of the hottest topics I am hearing about in my own customer conversations. Um, sometimes customers don't even know that they need it or they don't know what the word is. They just know that there's a problem they need to solve. And I think when we talk about the data fabric, one of the core concepts of the data fabric is to, that automation piece, right? Building in automation intelligence, having the, the, this concept of the data fabric starting to, to learn almost and start to help to be able to deliver the right data to the right people at the right time, like I said before. But the issue with that is it, it, that only takes you so far. You can build in kind of as much intelligence and automation as you as you want. But unless you have something that's going to give some level of observability into your data pipelines, into your data architecture in general, there's still this question of at the end of the day, when I'm when I'm sitting at the, the tail end of the data pipeline, right? I, I am sitting in the line of business. I'm an, an analyst. I'm trying to build a, a report. Um, I'm in finance. I'm trying to look at this this data um, that's you know representing my third quarter results, right? Um, the thing that matters is if the data is correct, and you absolutely need a, an observability platform to give you that confidence that your data is right. And so the way that we're starting to talk to our, our customers about this is, um, you know, how, helping to understand like, you know, when you look at your data pipelines today. Where do you see problems? Like, what are what are the things that you're struggling with? And a lot of times it is this idea of, you know, I have all these pipelines scheduled and, you know, something fails and it blocks the execution of everything else. Or, um, you know, everything will run, but then all of a sudden, like, the, the volume of data that's supposed to be moving through, like, this pipeline pushes, you know, hundreds of gigs of data through it overnight. And all of a sudden, we're down to, to five gigs of data, or, you know, my reports were empty or missing some values. And it took me two days to figure out like where the break in the system was. And so this concept of data observability, I think has really kind of um, grown out of this idea of application observability. I think that's really where observability started. Um, it, you know, if you're thinking about this idea of like application monitoring and observability, really easy to tell when your application goes down, right? It's like immediately obvious, you get a 404 when you hit that website, like something's wrong. But data is much harder to pinpoint, right? It's much harder to figure out when something is wrong. And it might be minutes or hours or days, hopefully not weeks, but sometimes weeks before you actually figure out that there's a problem. And so, you know, I think that a lot of organizations are starting to realize after they put in all this time and energy into building a data fabric architecture, and they're really starting to like get going with um, this, this new kind of concept is that they're still hitting this problem of, oh my gosh, my data isn't right. I, I don't have visibility into, you know, what what's being put onto this report, what's being fed into this machine learning model. And that's really where observability is going to come in and help. Yeah, the, you know, I've heard this uh, connection to uh, like data downtime or data yep. outages or which basically you're talking about a data quality or data reliability problem, essentially. But very much like in security, like I used to be, so I was in software doing testing, software development, and then I moved into security and now I'm in data. And I see a lot of similarities between all these fields. Like the, the first field is so from a software delivery perspective, it's like, hey, we want to go as fast as we can and deploy as much as we can, as fast as we can and to be competitive and to have new feature updates and to patch things and whatever, right? So there's like the speed problem that the software application team feels constantly. That's exactly what the data team also feels like. Totally. People say things, I feel like they feel like they're underwater. They feel like they're, you know, there's too much firefighting going on and so on. So that's also at stake. But then on the security side, 
a lot of times in security, it's like, you don't know what you don't know until something blows up, right? It's like for software, you could pretty much know right away if something from a UX experience perspective, like you were saying, you log on to the browser and it's not there. Okay, something's wrong with the software. But with data, you may not know that. And it really becomes a security problem. At, at times, like from a security perspective, a lot of times people don't even know that there's, they have unknown security issues until it gets made public or something bad happens. Uh, and they're just, you know, they're just, they're assuming everything's okay. And I think this, there's a lot of similarities between those fields um, in that, you know, they want to go as fast as you can from a software side, but we also want to detect and have, you know, the, uh, figure out the unknowns while we're going as fast as we can so that we don't have these, you know, potentially uh, really costly data impacts to the business. Yeah. And, and even operationally, right. Speaking of speed, when, you know, we often see IT teams who are completely overloaded, right? They have a zillion requests they need to get through, might take honestly months for someone who has requested access to data to, to get what they need from the team. They're usually really understaffed, um, especially after, you know, coming off of the heels of the pandemic, we've heard about the great resignation. And so these teams are totally overloaded. And what they spend the majority of their time on right now, not only just building data pipelines, but debugging data pipelines and trying to figure out where things went wrong. And so if you can help lift that burden off of the team with observability, and you can kind of take that mean time to detection from maybe days down to like a couple of minutes, it saves so much time for the team. And they can really just focus on the work that matters instead of focusing on trying to debug where a problem happens. Yeah, I was, I was uh, on LinkedIn the other day and there's this uh, gentleman um, that works for, uh, he's an engineer, data engineer over at Meta. And he was discussing LinkedIn, uh, an example of data incident management, which is essentially uh, observability that's operationalized, you know, within your thing. And he said, if he said, uh, this is basically how a triage basically works. He goes, you frantically ping a senior data engineer who's been on the team for four four plus years and ask them for urgent help. Second, if she isn't available, spend hours debugging a pipeline by spot checking thousands of tables. Oh God. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's true though. It's like that that's like kind of the reality of if you don't have something in place that is constantly and continuously observing what's going on with your data, you're eventually gonna run into an issue. And one of the things I like to do is I try to make Sometimes I'm really good at analogies. Sometimes I'm terrible at them. But here's an analogy that <laughs> I think will make sense. But let's see if this makes sense. But, you know, there's been a lot of, like, increase in the popularity of Formula One racing recently. It's, like, exploding. Uh, have you been to Formula One, like, a race uh, racing event there? My brother is, like, so into Formula One and, like, organizes his whole weekend schedule around the races. But I've never been to one. So I haven't either. But I, I want to go because people tell like, oh, you got to see this Netflix documentary. It's awesome. It's like super cool. Well, here's the thing with with these cars. And I didn't realize this until recently. But these cars have like hundreds of sensors on the car as it's yeah. driving. And so, you know, it talks about your tire pressure, your engine, your electrical, your brakes or all these things that tie in to the car to alert the team around, do we, need to have, do we need to come in for a pit stop? Or can we keep going as fast as we can and go a little bit further before we actually know to stop, right? Totally. They don't just drive blindly and look at their watch and go, okay, maybe I should check in with the radio tower to see if I can come in. No, they're constantly you know, telling them, hey, it's about time to come in. You got to get gas. You got to change your tires. You got all these things. And I was thinking about that. And I was like, that's basically what you know, making the connection to software and data engineering team. This is exactly what they're doing. They're trying to go as fast as they can to win the race, to deliver the results. But at the same time, they need something that's going to help them in their job continuously observe what's going on so they can be alerted around, hey, these are issues that you need, to, you need to address. And sometimes it could be an alert that you go, you know what? I don't need that. that thank you for letting me know, but it's actually fine. Like, I, I'm good. I think the car will make it. We're okay. We need to keep moving. We'll address that at a later date. And the other one is you better pull over right now or your car is going to blow up. Yes, that would be bad. Well, Ryan, you said you were bad at analogies, but I think that was an excellent analogy for observability. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. I've used that <laughs> analogy a couple of times. Hey, there you go. <laughs> well, hey, we're, we're coming up on time here. Uh, I did want to give a, a quick plug for 
the new integration that we have with Data Band and IBM Data Fabric with Data Stage. So yes. feel free to give us a quick spiel on that. Yes, we're so excited about this one. So um, Data Stage is, is part of the product portfolio that I run. Um, Data Stage is our premier ETL tool inside of IBM. Uh, we've done a ton of work on it over the last three years to completely re-architect it to be cloud native. Um, we're really excited about it. It has like a totally new modern uh, experience. We've essentially ripped everything out except our super performant PX engine and built this entire new experience around um, how you actually build modern data pipelines. So we're super excited about that one. And um, we just, I think uh, just a couple of weeks ago, actually, it was we launched the integration with uh, data band. So what this gives us is, um, so we can uh, take a look at a couple of different things from a data stage perspective. Uh, data stage has this concept, it's a no code, low code ETL tool. So uh, we have this concept of a flow, which is effectively your data pipeline that you're building from a design time perspective. And we can look at um, different properties for a flow. We can look at different stages in the flow. So stage represents a particular connection or a transformation or um, you know, a manipulation of the data in some way. And so we can look at kind of stage level um, kind of characteristics and we can actually look at the data as it's flowing through. We can look at schema changes on the connector side. We can look at um, input and output row level metrics. So there's tons of different things that we can observe. And then one of the great things about data band that I love is the, the lineage view. So you can actually see where a problem is happening um, and kind of drill down into uh, you know, exactly where the problem occurred and really quickly triage what's going on. So I, I think that the analogy that I love to use is that um, data band is like the, the Google Maps traffic view. When you're looking at Google Maps, you can see real-time views of where traffic is super heavy, um, where there's construction, where there's been an accident, um, where you have to, where there's like, you know, a, something you have to pay a toll on. And so it gives us real time insights. Google Maps gives us real time insights into the, the traffic conditions and data band gives us real time insight into how our data pipelines are performing, how data site data stage pipelines are performing. But one of the best things is obviously a, an ETL tool doesn't exist in a silo. Um, so with data band, we can really kind of get more insight into the, the end to end flow that a customer is using, hooks into orchestration tools that they might be using. So there's tons of flexibility with it. We're super, super excited about it. Um, we think it really takes our, our capabilities to the next level. Um, we were very excited to be the, the first IBM product that data band integrated with. So super excited about that one. Yeah, no, it's awesome. I mean, I, I mean, one of the things that we really made sure about is like the integrations we have with any version of Airflow that you're using or Spark or DBT or you're using code-driven pipelines like using Scala or Java or Python or whatever. We're trying to take all those same capabilities and bring them to this next gen version of Data Stage as well. So, I mean, again, like you said, this goes back to initially your, your point about meeting people where they're at. We have a lot of customers that are, you know, using uh, Airflow only to do almost everything that they that they have, or they're really investing into DBT and they don't have Data Stage. That's totally fine. Uh, we're bridging the gap between um, some of the modern tech that is going on at IBM and also a lot of the current tech that's going on, especially the open source community and being that uh, observability tool that goes across all those. So I'm excited about it. Obviously, uh, we did a webinar on it. So if you're here and you want to go watch the webinar, you can go to the webinar. Uh, but, uh, one last couple of things before we uh, head out here, it, you know, we talked about a lot, like what, what's one thing you want somebody to take away with, and then how can people connect with you after, uh, after this? Yeah. So I think one thing to take away, obviously on the observability side, right. I think going back to some teams might not even know what to ask for. I think the the important thing to walk away from that is, you know, are, are there things that your your data teams are struggling with today? Are there areas where they're spending a lot of manual time and effort? If so, you probably need an observability platform, right? It, it's one of those things that I think oftentimes um, it, it's more of like a, a discovery journey from the engineering side where they have to kind of raise their hand and say, hey, we need help with this. So if, if you're sitting um, in, you know, on the side of the business, if you are managing a data engineering team, it's good to check in with the team and see, you know, what can we do to make their lives easier because the, the return on investment is enormous. Um, so definitely on the observability side, I would say that. 
from a data fabric perspective in general, I think it goes back to the um, what we had talked about at the beginning, where you know don't let the concept of a data fabric architecture scare you. It's not something that needs to to happen overnight. It's not something that you need to kind of throw out your whole infrastructure for and and start fresh, right? You just want to kind of pick the the one one use case that you want to start with and um, get started building small, and then you can expand later and bring in other parts of the fabric as it makes sense. But you don't have to bring in every single piece. Um, so those are the, I guess I gave you two pieces of advice, um, but I think those are two two very important concepts. Um, and then in terms of, of finding me, um, I am on LinkedIn, I'm on Twitter, um, definitely reach out. I'm in the Boston area. So if anyone's local to Boston, always willing to uh, meet up and, and chat about your, your data needs um, or just hear about problems that you're facing, right, in the, the data engineering space. Um, but yeah, would, would love to connect with anyone who wants to reach out. Well, Jesse, thanks for coming on the podcast. Really appreciate you being the first uh, IBM person. Yeah, thanks, Ryan. And you know what? This, this is going to be hard to top. You know, we may not have any other other people from IBM beyond this uh, podcast. <laughs> you set the bar really high. Super high. Um, there we go. Well, hopefully, you'll see Jesse at some conferences next year and connect with her on LinkedIn, follow her on Twitter. Thanks everyone for listening. And Jesse, we'll talk soon. Thanks, Ryan.